uh, Jerry Moen of uh, Wisconsin is a retired professor is going to present totally screw me up so is going to present on uh, positional air standards as it relates to ALTAs and NSPS surveys uh, positional certainties etc so that sucked but yeah. I will turn that over to you to you jerry let me let <laughs> what me happens see. when we haven't done it in a month and jerry uh, uh jerry kept emailing me and goes why are we keep canceling why do we keep canceling yeah so um, he's like i'll i'll do one i'll do one for you so hey can you enable screen sharing so i no, can put yes. my my thing up here done you're good okay so <laughs> uh screen one everybody see my presentation there sure can everybody yeah, see it and it is up now okay um well this this um this started out in an innocent fashion and it quickly ballooned out of control to the point where i wound up with more questions than i had answers and it, I'm, I'm still at that point right now and and i specifically wanted dan to be here because dan's my sounding board uh, whenever I have any kind of issues like this to deal with, I throw them at Dan because he's got a lot of experience with both the technology uh, that I've been kind of divorced from for the last couple of years since I've uh, retired multiple times. And uh, he's been working with a lot of software and he really gets into the adjustment side of things. And he and I had some philosophical discussions on this type of stuff. And like I said, I kind of bloomed out of uh, beyond what, what I originally intended to do. I, I, I this this idea kind of cropped up initially because working with NLC prep, I was rewriting the FS course, uh, the different modules in that. So we're doing a complete rewrite of that course to update with respect to current regulations. And I was working on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the section on ALTA NSPS standards, uh, or ALTA NSPS surveys and talking about what they were all about and and all that kind of stuff and stepping through the standards and kind of explaining what the different things meant. And I got to the positional standards and uh, it kind of reminded me of the situation that we had in Wisconsin uh, a number of years ago where they were looking to update the uh, minimum survey standards that we had in our administrative code in AE7. And so they kind of looked around for different models to use because what we had wasn't really contemporary anymore. It was based on the old transit tape survey. So we had standards like you had to close with one in 3,000 and your traverses had to have a maximum angular misclosure of two minutes and that type of stuff. You looked at, you know, it's dated. So it needed to be updated and it needed to be reflective of not just the type of accuracies or whatever that were, that were reasonably achievable today, but also were reflective of or could be adapted to the technolo technology that allowed us to modify the traditional methods of surveying properties and that. So we're not close, running point to point traverses and all that stuff. So the legislative committee got involved and they were shopping around or looking around to see what other states were doing. And they happened uh, to look at, because most more surveyors were getting involved doing ALTA uh, NSPS surveys, which originally had been the ALTA ACSM surveys, and it just kind of transitioned over right before the 2011 standards. Those are the ones that were in effect at the time they were looking to rewrite or update the Wisconsin standard. So they basically used that as a model because it made sense to them in the context of modernizing the, the standards somewhat. So what they did was they, they took and they updated the standard and incorporated into it something based on what ALTA and SPS was saying. And basically the parts that they added were a relative positional accuracy standard. Now in ALTA and SPS, they call it the relative positional precision but in Wisconsin, for some reason, they decided to call it the relative positional accuracy. And it's, it's, again, based on the 95% confidence interval. Uh, but they don't say anything about air ellipses in here, the, the length of the semi-major axis of the air ellipse like it did in the standards. And uh, instead of using the criteria, the numerical values that ALTA and SPS used at that time, they instead loosened them up a little bit and said it was going to be uh, 13.13 feet plus 100 parts per million. 
a little bit looser than what all the and um they they use the adjacent property corners uh approach so our <clears throat> Oh my! Excuse me. They use that says they're at the adjacent property. There were any property corners. It wasn't just the adjacent ones, which is what the Alta and SBS standards said at the time. That has since been changed. So we, we get into this thing about we're, we're talking more and more when you look at NGS data sheets about local versus network accuracy. Uh, where are we with respect to the grand scheme of things, or where are we with respect to our our own points, our own projects, and that type of thing? So there was a little bit of difference from it. Now, I wanted to, this is the current Alta NSPS position standards. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that are in here that raise some, some question about how do we interpret this and how is this applied and, and what were some of these things that, that, that caused some issues. Uh, right off the bat, it defines it as the length of the semi-major axis of the air ellipse uh, expressed in meters or feet relative to position of a monument to an adjacent boundary corner. So it's not to any corner on the property, it's just to the adjacent ones, to, to both sides, at the 95% confidence interval. Uh, and it can be estimated by the results of a correctly weighted least squares adjustment of the survey. So now this, this you know, the old traditional Wisconsin one that we had, the one in 3000, that was all based on the old compass survey, compass adjustment and that type of thing. And, and you really couldn't apply this type of standard to that type of survey. But it also finishes off with 95% confidence interval or approximately two standard deviations. And you hear this reference to two sigma uh, uh, confidence level and that type of thing. And the numbers that Alta NSPS uses is two centimeters or 0 0.07 feet plus 50 parts per million. So Wisconsin is about twice that amount. But basically, similar type of standard. And I haven't looked at other states, and maybe some of you that, that are participating tonight can let me know. Uh, if your states have adopted something similar to the way the Alta AC or Alta NSPS standards are, or if you've gone off entirely different on a different type of approach. But I started looking at this, and this is when I start conversing back and forth with Dan about some things, uh, as to what some of these numbers meant. Now, just as a quick review for some of you that if you work with least squares adjustments or not, uh, an air ellipse is basically just a two-dimensional uh, expression of what our confidence is for where a horizontal position is located. And a 95% confidence interval is basically that standard air ellipse increased uh, to a 95% level of confidence. Uh, and I always tell my students, you know, if you want 100% confidence, you just increase the standard air ellipse by infinity on both axes and you got everything covered, you know. Uh, okay, but... So anyway, there are absolute and there are relative air ellipses. The absolute air ellipses are the actual point position. Where are the points within your reference framework around the face of the Earth? There are relative ones, which are where the points with respect to each other. So what, what we're getting at with the Alta NSPS standards are the relative, where are points with respect to each other? Because you can have two very poorly defined points in, in terms of a spatial system, but as long as they're relative to each other, you know, they're fine as far as meeting the standard net goes. That goes back to the old, I'm going to assume this is 10,000, 10,000 for this point here, and that way is north. That has no bearing or no connection to uh, any type of a formal coordinate system. So from a network viewpoint, it sucks. But from a relative viewpoint, my stuff is still good with respect to each other. It's got internal integrity in that. So basically, that's what we're looking at with this is the, the relative air ellipses, which would be the equivalent to the local accuracy as opposed to the network accuracy. Right? <clears throat> but some things bother me. Okay? Like I say, right, for being retired, I should leave well enough alone. I think this header on this thing kind of kind of sums it up for me. Is I started down a rabbit hole. Now, once you start down a rabbit hole, uh, it's hard to get out of it. So um, some things bother me. It's like, what does plus or minus 0 0.13 feet plus 50 parts per million or the, the Alta uh, standard, uh, two centimeters plus 50 parts per million, what does that mean? 
How do you interpret that? Because there, there are no examples of that in the standard. It just makes that statement. And it says the relative positional precision is based on a 95% confidence interval ellipse at 95% confidence. And it says approximately two standard deviations. Well, where does that come from? And so then, again, here's my, my gratuitous, you know, uh, introduction to Dan Rodman here. He, he's one of these guys I started asking these questions about. And, and he and I got a discussion going back and forth. And Dan, if I misquote you on anything or say anything totally, please, you know, hop in here and, and say, because the whole point of this is, is to learn. And I would rather this be more of a discussion than it is a lecture or a presentation because I don't know this stuff. I'm, I'm asking questions on this too. And I've ran into some bumps and stuff here that maybe somebody else can help point, point out on this. But anyway, so the first, if I look at these uh, at these two things, two issues, what does that uh, plus or minus mean? And the relative positional precision to two standard deviations and all that kind of stuff. We look at those separately. The first issue, the numerical uh, the interpretation of what does that mean? And, and this is where I started to run into some really differences, divergence of opinions and stuff and how to interpret this stuff. Uh, the, the, the relative precision, relative positional precision is based on random errors and random errors are, tend to be small. They, they are likely to be positive or negative. So the more times you repeat a measurement, the more opportunity you give those things to cancel and to narrow down your uncertainty in that. So that's why we repeat measurements is just to, to refine them. And we usually express those as a plus or a minus or with a plus or minus symbol in front of it. So, for example, like on an old GPS, if you pull uh, an old uh, toll station, if you pull out the specifications, you look at it, you'll see something like what I've got shown here for the Topcon GTS 30. You see plus or minus, and then parentheses, two millimeters plus two parts per million times the distance. And that's a manufacturer stated error or manufacturer stated accuracy. And so it consists of two parts. It consists of a constant, which kind of is a, kind of a dumb name to give an uncertainty because it's not constant, it's plus, plus or minus. And then you got a proportional part that's based on the distance. So regardless of how long a distance you measure, there's going to be that, that constant part that's going to be an uncertainty that built, that's built in your measurement. As you increase the length that you're measuring, you're going to see a greater effect be given to that proportional part. And if you look at your GPS receiver specifications, you see the same darn thing. You see them for horizontal, you see them for vertical. And you'll see different values for uh, static versus uh, uh, RTK and all this kind of stuff based on the amount of data that's used to process to get the positions and all that kind of stuff. So the question becomes is, is how is that interpreted? Now, going back to the adjustment computations books like, like Gilani, and, and old Mikhail's uh, textbook and stuff like that. When you look at those types of uh, 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 errors, they're treated as separate errors. So that when you want to find out their effect on a measured distance, you would use the error of a sum where you're taking the first one squared plus the second one squared, add them together and take the square root. That's how it propagates uh, at randomly in uh, random errors. Or do you evaluate it as a straight sum? That is, you've got the seven uh, plus or minus seven feet plus, plus that uh, di proportional distance together, and then treat that as a singular type of error. And this is what we ran into initially a philosophical difference between what the way uh, Dan was looking at and the way I was looking at. Because I looked at the traditional way of treating them as two errors. Because to me, I saw that 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 uh, constant being as that's an error that's always going to be there. The other one is also an error that's going to always be there. If I add them together, then I'm assuming that it's always the worst case scenario with those errors. They always add, They always work together in the same direction. Whereas random errors really operate 
you know, contrary to each other. So in some cases, the, the proportional part could be smaller and the constant part could be larger and vice versa. And that was the whole part behind that. So that became one of the questions that, that I had is how do we evaluate that? So, and, and, and Dan made some really strong arguments based on software and stuff that, um, that, that the software is being away and that they're not inherently independent errors because they're based on the same measurement, the same thing that's being measured. So they're not really independent of each other. So we can look at it that way. Um, and most of the software treats it as a linear, a, an addition rather than an error of a sum. So I was confused. So what I did is I went straight to the horse's mouth. I contacted Gary Kent <laughs> because he's been shepherding these standards for decades. And I asked him, I, I, I gave them the scenario and I, 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 you know, give, and I said, how, how, how does he interpret this? So my question to him was, uh, how is the, uh, how's the RPP computer? Is the error of a sum or is a simple sum? And I said, it's, it's equally, it's doubly important because it's not just affecting your Alta NSPS surveys, but now that we're adopting this, at least in Wisconsin, other surveys are going to be affected by this also. So how do we analyze it? And, and Gary's response was, it was interesting because he said, with regard to calculating RPP of a given point, I agree with that. I think the proper calculation would involve the square root of the sum of the squares. Now, I went and I looked back at a bunch of his presentations where I could find to see if he ever talked about this. And I could never find anything about that. And, and they think he's it, down there, he says, besides uh, Galani Brown, Elrich, and McHale and Gracie in his materials, that's how I teach it when the host organization gives me enough time to spend on the topic. See, basically, when he does presentations, his time frame doesn't allow him to get into the nuances of the stuff. So he says, my handout shows the square root of the sum of the squares as a proper calculation. Then he throws in one last sentence, which just confuses everything all over again. There have been times, for sake of time, and to make a brief point, that when showing what is allowed by this, I simply add them together. But I tell people that the handout goes into much more detail. So he kind of fuels the fire at the same point. He says, well, conceivably, this is the way it should be, you know, the sum of the squares. Uh, but then at the end, he says, to keep it simple, I just tell him that this exists also but that there's more detail on the handout. I'd expect him to go read it. So did that clarify things for me? N no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so again, again, the purist in me goes back to the theoretical nature of this whole thing and looks at it as two separate random errors that we propagate as the, the square root of the sum of the squares. The pragmatist in me says, maybe it's not so. And uh, Dan went so far as to contact some of the instrument manufacturers, specifically Trimble, and ask how they came up or how they come up with that standard for their equipment. And, and Dan, you could probably do this more eloquently than I can, but basically they said we use the linear, the addition, right? Dan, that's your cue to jump in. <laughs> That's correct. I asked Trimble through Holly Urbane here in Wisconsin, and they said, look, you know, we we consider that just as like a, a linear model for how error goes up as you measure a longer distance. You know, it's just uh, think of it as like a um, empirical test. You know, we you 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 measure, you know, 500 more feet in distance, you're the standard deviation in that measured distance goes up a certain amount. You add 500 more feet to that distance, the standard deviation. I don't know, you know, and you're really splitting hairs because these things measure distances so accurately. But just because it's in a textbook that, you know, if these were two independent random errors, you would combine them by error of a sum. Right. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that the standard does that. And that doesn't mean that an instrument manufacturer's EDM, like, if they say it's a straight sum, they're the ones testing the instrument, right. you know? Right. So, and, and it, the other thing I'll say is that StarNet 
has been computing the allowable on the ALTA standard as a straight sum, I think ever since it's been in there and it's been in there a long time. And so I don't know, like, you know, people need to talk to Starnet if they're going to teach it a different way. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure Trimble, they only added the ALTA test a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a straight sum in there too. So who's talking to Trimble and talking to Starnet saying you're doing it wrong? Right. But, you but, know, yeah, let's yeah, let's yeah. not, you know, let's, and I don't even think this is the biggest issue. Um, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, Dan, Dan, yeah. Dan's got some other concerns with respect to this that mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll open up to a little bit later on. But the other, the other thing I wanted to consider here also is that to a certain extent, we might be looking at apples and oranges here, because the way I've been looking at discussing it so far is for an instrument making measurements, and whether they're they're independent or dependent uh, uh, errors with respect to each other. The standard isn't necessarily based on that same premise, so the standard itself could be investigating two independent variables because it's a combination of all sorts of measurements, not just based on a distance measurement and that type of thing. So it could very well be that the standard may in fact, that plus or minus uh, 0 0.07 uh, feet plus 50 parts per million could in fact be two independent variables or two independent errors. So they would be evaluated as some of the square roots uh, of, of those, uh, the, the square root of the sum of the squares of those. That's why we need a little bit more clarification with respect to this. So again, th this is that rabbit hole. It's getting deeper the further we go down it. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, what I did is I, I did some calculations to figure out what kind of a difference would it make applying either the linear error or the square root of the sum of the squares of the error on some you know typical survey type of sizes. So using just a lot survey, 150 by 100 foot lot survey, when I computed <laughs> those two values using the ALTA standard, uh, it only made a difference of five thousandths of a foot and eight thousandths of a foot on the size of those things. So for a lot survey, it doesn't make any difference. However, when you're doing an ALTA survey, you're not always doing just a lot survey. If a developer is looking to develop a large piece of land, there could be larger distances involved. So out of, I just grabbed one that was a couple thousand feet long. And once we get into something that's a thousand, two thousand feet on the side, then we start to see some differences between using the, the square root of the sum of the squares and using the linear sum between those two. And it's okay, measurable, quote unquote, but they're in a couple of hundredths of a foot range. So th there is a difference between the two. And what I did is I plotted, uh, and these are plotted at the same scale. So you can see the effect of the Alta ACSM or Alta NSPS standard on one side and the Wisconsin standard using Wisconsin numbers on the other side, the difference between the linear, which is straight because it's linear, and the square root of the sum of the squares, which is actually curvilinear because of that, that uh, the power uh, at uh, the square root function. And you can see that uh, they get further and further apart the, the longer the distances become but that the linear one is the more forgiving of the two. That is, it's the larger one that is easier to meet than is the sum of the square, uh, sum of the squares, uh, the square root of the sum of the squares. Uh, and just out of curiosity, I threw at the end, uh, this goes all the way out to 2,000 feet, just because that was the number I went out to. Uh, at 2,000 feet, these represent in the traditional precision sense one in 13,000 versus one in about 18,000. And the Wisconsin one, one in 9,000 and about one in, uh, this one should be higher, I guess. I've got a math error in there somewhere. I got these two flipped. One in 6,800 is up here and one in 9,100 is here. But if you look at, if I'm shooting a quarter, quarter section, you know, I'm doing a quarter, quarter, uh, just over 1,200 feet, there's a difference between about uh, point. Uh, 18, you know, 18 hundredths of a foot versus 25 hundredths of a foot. So it's, it's, a, it's a substantial difference between the two. So there, there is a difference between, whoops, my mouse has been acting up on me. Dink, dink. 
Dink, dink, dink. Where am I? There we go. So there is a difference between the two, and it becomes, again, it becomes more pronounced at longer distances. The shorter distances, not so much. Okay, the second thing, uh, so that that's that's unresolved as far as I'm concerned. There's a little bit of confusion in there. The second one is that 95% interval were approximately two standard deviations. That two standard deviations bothered me. Because when we're talking about a 95% confidence interval, we're looking at, in surveying, we've got three different ways of surveying, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional. And what we're supposed to be looking at here with the ALTA standards is the two-dimensional representation, the two-dimensional survey. A univariate is a single variable. When we look at that, that's like elevations. We're, we're determining the elevation by differential leveling or by trig leveling or whatever, but we're only restricting ourselves to determining an unknown elevation and if we repeat the measurements, we get a bell-shaped curve, basically flip it on its side because what we're determining is elevation. And we have our 68% and our 95% uh, confidence intervals. Our 68% is our standard deviation, our regular standard deviation. And again, the more measurements we make, the narrower that gets, giving us a more precise measurement set. The 95% is generally taken at around it referred to as the two sigma, but it's right around 1.9 something, depending on the number of degrees of freedom. Because we know that the more measurements we make, the more confident we are in our measurements. But the two standard deviation analysis, the two sigma, is more of a univariate or one dimensional approach. When you get into a two dimensional approach, uh, now you got two standard deviations that you're dealing with. One in the in the north in northing uh, northing, and the other one in the easting, and they work together to define for you an area within which you want to express confidence that that point position is. You don't want to say that well, I'm confident uh, to ninety five percent that my x coordinate is this. I'm confident in x my y coordinate is this. I want to have an area that I'm confident ninety five percent of the time this is where my point's going to fall. That's my absolute, my absolute location. So we start by creating uh, the, the error rectangle around the point using the standard deviations coming out of the adjustment. Now from that, we create an ellipse that's, that's tangent to all four sides of that rectangle. And there's an infinite number of them that fit in there. The standard error ellipse is the one that maximizes the semi-major axis and minimizes the semi-minor axis. So I'm going to refer to that as the C, the standard error ellipse. So that's that red one that's shown on here. That's the guy that's based on the standard deviations, a 68% standard deviations in both directions. But in a two-dimensional sense, it only represents about 35% confidence of where that point is located at. And as, and as uh, Dan pointed out to me, and I really hadn't thought about in this terms, it's a volume. It's a volume underneath a three-dimensional bell-shaped curve. All right? Whereas in a univariate one, it's the area under a flat bell-shaped curve. Right? But now we have a, a, a three-dimensional guy. You can kind of squint your eyes and visualize that a little bit on my diagram. You can see it's three-dimensional, and my, my standard error ellipse, this guy up in here, that's a function of the standard deviations on both the X, our northings, and the eastings, gives me a 35%, about 35% confidence of that point position. To, to increase it to the 95% level, we have to scale it uh, to get it to be a larger representation. The question is, how much do we scale it by? Now, using that that two standard deviations works if you're generating two standard deviations on both the uh, x, the northings, and on the eastings, and then from that deriving an ellipse. But you don't just take the standard error ellipse and multiply it by two to get the 95% confidence interval. That, that's part of the problem we're running into on here. What it should be is based on uh, the number of observations that are made, because we know that the more observations we make, the more certain we are about a point's position. So if we've only got one redundancy, that's a relatively weak solution, even though it does give us a math check and that type of thing, versus 10 redundancies. And if you look at any 
any analysis of measurement accuracies and that type of stuff. And what you'll see is uh, uh, plots, uh, as you increase the number of measurements, the expected error starts to drop right away initially, and then it starts to taper off. And you get to the point of no, 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 uh, no additional benefit from additional measurements and that type of thing. But generally, the first couple of measurements that you make really drops down that, that narrows down that uncertainty. And then, uh, so we know that, that somehow the, the degrees of freedom or the redundancies come into play. So how do we define that? Well, Galani and again, others that written adjustment textbooks say that uh, one way to do that or a real popular way to do is using the F statistic. And it goes into derivations and all that kind of stuff. But basically the F statistic is a multiplier that takes into account two variables, in this case, the northing and the easting. And you go to the tables and extract from the table based on the number of degrees of freedom that you have, a multiplier that you multiply by to take the square root of that. And that gives you a multiplier for the axes for the ellipse. Okay, it sounds more complicated than it really is. But basically, I've extracted from the table uh, a couple of uh, degrees of freedom levels for the 95% confidence interval uh, out of the F statistic table. And that one, that F statistic is 199.5. And as soon as I get to the second degree of freedom, notice how quickly it drops down. And then it drops down some more and some more and some more and some more until it gets down and it starts to stabilize down this area here. If you go all the way out to the limit that was in the table of 120 degrees of freedom, you're up to an FS of 3.07. Okay? So you can see that that initial first couple set of measurements drops that F statistic down tremendously. So if I just had one degree of freedom and I want to compute my multiplier, I'd say that my F statistic is 199.5. If I stick that into this equation, that gives me a multiplier for my semi-major and semi-minor axis of, of 20. So my semi-major and semi-minor axis will be 20 times as large as my standard error ellipse for that 95% certainty. And that makes sense because I only got one redundancy. Whereas if I've got 10 redundancies, that drops me down to 2.86 for my multiplier. So now my 95% confidence interval is 2.86 times as much. Okay. And, and, and I figured it out. Look, yeah, for uh yeah, for the C to equal two for that two standard deviations, uh, it would exceed the 120 the 120 number uh, degrees of freedom that are in the table. You can't even pull that out of the table based on that. And as a matter of fact, I think if you got the infinity, I haven't checked this yet because I just haven't had time, but if you got the infinity, it probably still wouldn't be that low anyway. And I think the infinity, you start to get down to some of the numbers that some of the adjustment packages are using. So, but basically the, the, the multiplier should be a function of the degrees of freedom in the network. The more degrees of freedom, the more confident we are at that 95% level. <laughs> so all this gives rise to a third issue. Okay. Uh, with hey, a Jerry, can of, I just yeah, yeah. can I just clarify something there? Um, can you can you back up to the one dimensional? Oh, the one dimensional. Um, oh yeah, go like yeah there. Sure. So sure. you know where we there's two issues here. One is like one dimensional versus two dimensional. And, you know, basically where one dimensional, the probabilities area under a curve, two dimensional with the ellipse, the ellipse is like a contour and it's volume under a surface. So if we don't think about fact, like, like considering how well we know this standard deviation, uh, you know, which is the degrees of freedom thing and the F statistic and everything, then we're talking about a multiplier of 1.96 in one dimension. Right. And we're talking about a multiplier of 2.45 in two dimensions. And the difference between those two, you know, the 1.96 being like the two sigma that we all know about, right? right? Uh, the, you know, the manufacturer says, oh, yeah, it's good to, you know, one centimeter. Well, that's always one centimeter RMS or like one sigma. So you double it for 95%. 
you know. So these error ellipses, even if you don't consider that degrees of freedom stuff, the error ellipse is like in Starnet, for example, the 95% error ellipse is always 2.45 times the size of the standard error ellipse. And that's not about the degrees of freedom. That's just because it's the volume under a surface versus the area under a curve. That's how Al Bondro explained it to me yeah. like years ago when I started like worrying about this late at night. <laughs> so, so that's one issue why the scaling is different. The second issue is this degrees of freedom thing you say. And you'll notice that like if you go, go a few forward to that F table, uh, yeah, that. If you take degrees of freedom all the way out to uh, infinity for this for this F test, your C will get down to 2.4477. Like that's as low as it'll go. And that's basically the idea of like, yeah, you really know your population standard deviation. And if you really know that, then a, an ellipse built with that has to be 2.45 times bigger. Right. Um, so th the fact that those multiplies get even bigger when you consider degrees of freedom. That's a one dimensional issue, just like it's a two dimensional issue. Right. If you yeah. like go back to statistics, that's about using the students, what's it called? The T student, distribution. The student T distribution. Instead yeah. of the Z distribution, right? That it's not like if you don't really know your, your standard deviation, you only know it from like a population hmm. of 10, like you know, then it's not 1.96, it's like two point whatever. So it's it's two different issues there. Yeah. You know, one is one dimension versus two dimensions and, and your ellipse multiplier is always gonna be 2.45 or lower. It's not gonna be two. Um, and, and then there's this, like some software uses degree of freedom, some doesn't. Right. Yeah, that, was, that, that leads into this third issue. Uh, that I that kind of came up out of all this stuff here, and let me get back to that slide. Uh, third, third, oh, third issue, okay, here. Um, which got a couple of submissions. Results of a correctly weighted least squares adjustment of the survey. Okay, so that's a no-brainer, right? Because we're all using least squares software, and it does all the adjustments for us. We just feed all of our numbers, and bang, it comes out with the adjustment. And a lot of the packages now are including the Alta ACSM checks in there as an option where you can select which lines you want to have do the checks on or just let it go through and do all the checks on everything. So, so it'll, it'll tell you, are you meeting the standard? Well, again, the question is, is if it has an Alta ACSM test, how is our Alta NSPS test, which version is it using? Is it using the linear or is it using the squared one, okay? Uh, how does it scale the standard error lips to get that 95%? Is it a, a multiplier of 2.45, or is it one based on degrees of freedom? And which I, and this is a real important, this is a critical one right here, which a priori values, if any, can the user input? And then how does the software use it? Now, the a priori values, we'll get to that in just a second, but um, check the document for the first one. You know, check the documentation to see how, if you have the uh, the NS or the Alta NSPS test built into the software, if it explains how it does it, chances are it's going to be the linear, okay? Because uh, there's nothing to indicate otherwise. But check the documentation, and sometimes when you have all this verbose output from a uh, least squares adjustment, you have page after page after page of output, there'll all be stuff buried inside there that we can all understand. And then uh, how does it uh, scale the standard error loops? Like Dan said, most of them use that 2.45 multiplier, which is basically based on that infinite degrees of freedom type of stuff. Or does it use something else? Now, Traverse PC, some of you may or may not be familiar with Traverse PC, but I've used that for years for instruction. That uses the F statistic. And SALSA uses the F statistic. How many of you are familiar with SALSA adjustment software? Uh, that's, that was put out under a federal grant by the University of Texas at uh, El Paso, is it? Oh, no, Austin. 
that's a, a general least squares adjustment package. I still started looking. I haven't had a chance to dig into it too much, but it's a pretty detailed software package. It, it's it's open source. Or it's, uh, I don't know if it's open source, but it's freeware. It's available for free. Uh, pretty impressive looking packet. But on top of that, there's also the other information that we get coming out of the software that tells you whether it's passed the chi-squared test, which is a test of the statistical viability of the adjustment. And if it doesn't, uh, does it apply another multiplier to stop? So you got to kind of look to see what is it actually doing with your data, okay? Because unlike the compass rule, which if I give a room full of students the same data and tell them to adjust it by the compass rule, unless they make a math mistake, they should all come up with the same result. But I'm not sure that's true with software. As a matter of fact, I'll show you some examples of some stuff that that we that we ver that we checked here, and saw that uh, things aren't quite the same depending on which software that you're using. And the I a priori values. This is to me a real critical one because part of the correct weighting of the adjustments is not just putting in the information about the instrumentation but also putting in stuff about how well we're implementing using that instrumentation. I don't care how accurate or how experienced you are. You cannot set up an instrument perfectly over a point. There's always going to be some uncertainty associated with that. That affects the quality of your measurements and therefore your adjustment and, and the errors that you get coming out of the end. So there, there are two of those that we can input, the, the instrument-oriented type of stuff, you know, how what, what's the DIN specifications for the angle accuracy of your instrument, you know, the plus or minus constant plus parts per million, all that kind of stuff, which is used to generate some of the initial weights for your observations, along with the personal stuff about how well you can center the, the, the instrument over the points, so those personal types of errors. So does does your software allow you to input that and uh, or or does it not? Okay, so just like for example with the distance instrument oriented distance type stuff, are we using the uh, some of the squares or are we using a linear relationship? But that's that's one thing. But there's also setting up how accurately is the total station set up over one end. How accurately is, it, is the reflector set up at the other end? If you're working with GPS, you still got a centering issue. And I don't care if you got tilt compensation and stuff, there's an uncertainty in that also. So there's that, we have to take that into account. When you look at angles, angles are really fun because there's so many different sources of error center. There's the instrument set up, there's a target set up at both the backside and the foresight. There's a distance, distance of targets, which affects pointing error. There's also the specifications for the instrument. There's all sorts of stuff that come into play. So when you look at the propagation of the air that's in there, there's a lot of stuff that's got to be taken into account. You want your software to be able to adapt to this. Now, the, the two packages <clears throat> I looked at, and I, uh, Dan helped me with this because he's got the late access to the latest version of microsurveys uh, StarNet, which I don't. So I had him, uh, we, we ran the same test data through two different packages. I had him run it twice in Starnet, once with the uh, Alta Ace, Alta NSPS checking turned on and the other time with it turned off. And really the only difference between the two was a report on how well it met the standard and that type of thing. Uh, but basically if we look at, and this is, I'm not sure what it looks like exactly in the latest version of Starnet, but my version that I've got, this is where you put in your estimates on your equipment and on your setup, that type of stuff. Now, the other software that I use that I've got access to is Traverse PC, and they have they added a least squares module to their software a couple of versions ago and just added uh, uh, the Alta checking in there and this re relatively recently. But when you set up their software, their observations, you can input the instrument a priori errors, but you cannot put in any centering errors. You can't put anything in there about how well you can set up the instrument over point and that type of thing. So that's why we ran both of these with the horizontal, uh, the, the target the instrument and the target setup is zero on the um, 
uh, in Starla, you may have been wondering about that why I specified that dam, but that's why it's because I couldn't do it inside of Traverse PC. Other than that, everything else was run the same. Okay. So what I did is I had a uh, seven point network, two fixed points, five unknown points with 10 angles, eight distances for eight degrees of freedom. And okay. total station specifications, five uh, plus or minus five feet plus five parts per million and the five second din. Okay. Instrument set, target set, but not used. We ran through both the programs and something really interesting happened. I got wildly different results. <laughs> if you compare, these are the adjusted coordinates for those points, Starnet in blue and Traverse PC in black. Okay? And you can see there are some differences in there that are substantial. AT, one, you know, a point almost uh, better than a tenth of a foot difference between adjusted coordinates uh, in the easting. Okay? On top of that, if you look at the standard deviations in the north and the east, this is the, the after the adjustment, the propagation, the airs, and all that kind of stuff in it. Uh, there were differences of three tenths of a three hundredths of a foot with all these guys here. Really interesting is the uh, ninety five percent air air, uh, air ellipses. Here's the uh, semi major and the semi minor axes, and the orientation of the ellipse, the, the direction of the semi-major axis. Uh, some of them are like 180 degrees apart from each other. So these, these are wildly different numbers based on the same input information and as close as I could figure to the uh, same type of a, a priori est estimates going into it. The biggest difference between the two was was that Starnet used that 2.45 multiplier for uh, scaling up the 95% confidence interval, whereas uh, Traverse PC uses the DF statistic. And I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think if I, if I figure out what it is for eight degrees of freedom, but it's nowhere near 2.45. The other difference is, is that the Starnet passed the chi-squared test and a Traverse PC for Windows failed that, that uh, chi-squared test, okay? So my question for you, th th this isn't conclusive. This is nothing that says, oh, this software is better than that software. But what I'm getting at is you guys are kind of at the mercy of your software, okay? What, what is it doing with the data? And when it does give you a pass or a fail, you say, well, I'll just run it through different software packages and see if it passes there. Because technically, it should pass regardless of the software package that we're using. Okay. So, like I said, this isn't supposed to be a conclusion. I need to invest. I, I, I didn't get a chance to get Salsa set up and run that yet. And Chuck Galani does have a program, the Just program that he has that he offers as an educational package for students to use for his adjustment package, for his uh, adjustment textbook. Uh, I'm having some issues trying to get that to run with a priority estimates. And stuff. It runs just fine without them, but I can't get to run with them yet. So I got to work that up. But I want to compare about four or five different packages to see if there's something that that it, there are some outliers one with respect to each other because if you got brand loyalty to a particular software package that doesn't necessarily mean that package is doing what you're expecting it to do or what you want to well how much control do you have over what it is or isn't doing in that type of like i say it's not the compass rule it's not your dad's compass rule anymore it's least squares and a lot of us i mean there's a lot that goes into understanding least squares. That's why I, you know, Dan, I think, is a wonderful resource on this because he really digs into this stuff. He he loves this stuff. You hear him say he loses sleep over this crap, right? <laughs> you know, I gave that up years and years ago. Not my a couple of retirements ago and that type of thing. But but unless you're that devoted and want to dig into it that much, you're pretty much at the mercy. Uh, of what happens with your software, whether you understand that or not, how, how to correctly set it up and that type of thing. So, um, I, so there's a couple, I, I guess, kind of a couple of observations that are just coming out of this. 
Um, the standard could be clear and more explicitly defined. If they intend in the standard to have it treated because it's a combination of measurements that lead to that, that those are to be treated as two separate random error sources that they explicitly state that the correct way to analyze it would be by such and such or by a linear. Because from what I've seen in the software, most of the software is doing it linear, okay, because of the way the standard's written. Uh, and the surveys you're dependent on the software for the analysis and adjustment, does it allow complete input of that setup information as well as the equ equipment information? Uh, are those used to generate weights and how are they used to generate the weights? Okay. Uh, does it scale? How does this scale the standard error ellipses? Is it defaulting to 2.45 or is it using something that's based on the F statistic? And, and the 2.45 might be okay for most cases, but if you're in a very lowly redundant situation, that might not be the appropriate way to scale that error lips up because you just haven't got the redundancies in the network to, to do it. Uh, and how easy is it to interpret the adjustment results? Okay, like I said, if you ever sat down and looked through some of this stuff, it's not always the easiest thing to try to figure out what your software is telling you when it gets to the end of it because there's just so much data density in that that it's hard to understand. Now, the other thing I didn't check into here <coughs> Was there anything having to do, this, this is all a looped type of traverses, this data that I was looking at here. So we didn't look anything at anything with a side shot uh, going to a property corner of that. And how do you evaluate the relative air ellipses between points that aren't connected by direct measurements and that type of thing? Uh, that's a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it carries a whole other layer of confusion to the, to the situation. Uh, I figured with this stuff right here, my hands are full enough as it is trying to figure this stuff out without branching off into, into that aspect of it and that type of thing so far. So uh, I guess that that's really all I got. Uh, you can see that I'm out of my rabbit hole there. I just left my shovel and walked away from it for now. Uh, but it's... it's it, it's something I think we need need to get cleared up or or, or talk more about. I'm kind of curious as to if, if any of you uh, that deal with Alta and SPS surveys, I, do you have that built into your software to do the checking? Do you? How do you deal with this? I mean, how do you interpret it? You know, have you ever run into any issues with any of these? Have you ever had your software? reject something because it didn't meet the standard and if so under what conditions and circumstances because they do make allowances for that in the standard says there it's recognizable and under certain situations environmental conditions may cause you not to meet the standard in which case you indicate that on your map right so they give you that out but my question is has anybody ever encountered that and what are the circumstances that cause you to encounter that or that you think cause you to encounter that and Dan, I'm going to leave the last five minutes for you, Dan, because Dan doesn't like the standard at all anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. I did uh, throw in the chat the salsa uh, surveyor's application for least squares adjustment right. uh, by Applied Research Laboratories out of the University of Texas, Austin. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. I, threw, I threw that link in there so everybody can download that. I hadn't heard of it uh, before, so I was went and downloaded that. Let me stop my share and okay. So, uh, okay, I'm looking at a chat. Okay. Washington, so that's 200 parts per million. Now, Utah, okay. So, you, there's a lot of states are adopting this. Uh, use examples, I'll yeah. Okay, that other question, theory, if you, um, yeah, vigorous, you know, this don't if you never understand this stuff and the and you know there's all this diff, particularly about how error ellipse is, is scaled and it's frustrating how they get scaled differently in different software and this group thinks they're right another group thinks they're right and they each have legitimate arguments i don't know if we'll ever resolve that um but you know if <laughs> it's going to be easier to pass the test if you get starnet is is one thing to say 
And, you know, I like that software for transparency and, and rigorousness and that just that it's been around forever anyway. So Starnet's not paying me, but I'll just say personally, I like it. Yeah. Uh, um, and, um, but in terms of meeting the ALTA standard, you know, there's so many more important things about doing good boundary surveys that are not about whether, you know, you completely understand the 700s plus 50 parts per million, right? Just, and no standard will ever nail down, will never ever create a standard that will reject every bad survey and accept every good survey, right? So it's what matters most is your professional judgment. Are you creating surveys with enough redundancy in them? Are you accounting for your systematic errors? You know, do you have enough redundancy to find your blunders? You know, did you shoot that important property corner under a tree just one time and call it good because you're Receiver said the RMS was two hundredths of a foot. You know that's bad, right? At least shoot it again a couple hours later or something, or you know get a side shot on it too. You know if it's important, get some redundancy on it. That kind of stuff. You know, and I'll just see if if people have other questions at this point. But if you never understand this stuff, don't kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're trying to pass, don't, like, don't literally kill yourself. Anyway, just don't kill yourself. <laughs> you know, don't don't hate yourself for for not, you know, uh, being able to absorb all this. This is not the most important thing about being no, a professional no, land surveyor. No. Yeah. But, I, but I think you do need to be familiar with what your software is actually understand a little bit more about what goes into the software and what the software is actually doing and, and yeah. not wind up treating it like a black box. We just right. feed numbers into it and numbers come out and that tells me it's good. I, I got to know if, if, what those numbers mean. The other, the other thing I, I really like about Starnet and then I'll, I'll be quiet for a while, but it's that, it's fairly easy in Starnet to combine different kinds of measurements in a really pretty simple way. Yeah. You can put your GNSS observations in there as coordinates, like grid coordinates, northing, easting, and, and elevation. And if you're working in a system like Wisconsin has our county coordinates where grid basically equals ground, there's no you know, significant scaling over a small area, then you can be completely know nothing about the coordinate system. And just, you can put those individual GNSS observations in as coordinate observations and put standard deviations on. You don't have to put them in as vectors and you don't have to say what your datum and your ellipsoid is and your geoid bottle and all that. Put those coordinates in as observations, put your total station angles and distances in there as observations, Put your differential leveling in there as observations too if you want to go 3d um, with your adjustment and and then star net and then turn on relative error lifts and positional tolerance checking and it'll it'll give you you know the check and it so it's simple that way and then it's also um you know, it's going to get, you're going to pass the test the easiest because it's not scaling up the error ellipses by as much. Uh, and, and I um, can't remember the other thing. Oh, it's, it's computing the allowable as a linear sum, which I don't know any software that doesn't, but you know, I don't, does Travers PC do the Alta test? Does it have a constant and a proportional part for I, making I, a test? No, I, I think that, I, I think that does as a linear sum also. And I think yeah, I is, don't know any is, software that doesn't. No, and I think part of that's uh, yeah. primarily primarily because of the way the standard is written. Uh, that's the easiest way to interpret it, uh, at least. Uh, Dan Messerich, Mes is that the name? You got a question? Um, so I understand. I, I hear you when you say don't kill yourself when we're trying to understand this. <laughs> um, I've been looking for a long time trying to figure out how to learn this stuff, but everything's all business related. Nothing is ever survey related or GNSS related. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy that bases a lot of philosophy off Kung Fu Panda. Mm -hmm. So is there a level zero? Where would I start? Algebra, trigonometry, calculus? Where does this chi stuff come from and where do I start? 
Good question. Who wants to handle that one? <laughs> well, I mean, it's tough because you know it's 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 error propagation. It's all based on statistics. All the least squares adjustment stuff is um, a whole bunch of matrix algebra. Um, and because they're nonlinear equations, you have to use differential yeah. equations to linearize them. So there's calculus, you know, differential calculus in there to, to actually build the math, I'm saying, you know, and then there's statistics, there's statistical theory about error propagation, the same theories that we get the simple theories from, like error of a series, yeah. error of a sum, error of a product. There are much more complex theories about variance and covariance. So it's, that's the real math going on. And you need right. a four-year degree in, you know, in geoposition, you know, geoscience or, or geospatial engineering. You need to go into PSU and Galani's program or Michigan or, or you know, Maine if you really want to know the math. Well, Otherwise, I don't, you know, I teach at a tech school. Yeah. And I just try to teach the basics, like what the heck is a residual? And I really spend a lot of time on what's a residual. All right, are they too big? Are they are they too small? What happens when they're all really? What happens when your residuals are zero? Is that good? You know, and that's yeah. actually bad yeah. because that means you don't have anything to check them against, right? They don't have any reason to adjust because there's nothing to adjust them with. Right. So I, I teach that kind of stuff in tech school. And then this stuff about how um, you know, the software is scaling things certain ways and different software scales stuff different ways. So I just teach them to be skeptical about the fancy statistics that come out and look at your residuals. Do you, are you getting residuals at all? And do you have enough residuals that look about as big as they should? Right. And that's something like this. That's what standard deviation of unit weight tells you. It's basically a big ratio of your residuals to what your your estimated errors. Right. That should be about one. They should be about as big as you thought they were going to be. So, you know, that's my two cents. It, yeah. it is. It's hard math, to find education somewhere in the middle. About the, this stuff. The, the math, the math you want to be sure that you got a good grounding in algebra and stuff. Trigonometry is helpful, too. But if. if like Dan says, most of the stuff is statistical in nature. And you don't want to just take any statistics class. What I would suggest you do is take a statistic that's designed for the measurement sciences, not a business statistics class or anything like that. But uh, I, I taught here part-time at UW Platteville in the engineering program, and they took a, a, a statistics for engineering class. And they had a book, a textbook that was Statistics for Engineers. And that keyed on measurement sciences. And that, that's what ours is. Ours is a measurement science. So when we talk about, you know, bivariate or univariate distributions and that type of thing, that's right up our, our line of stuff. We don't consider, we're not worried about social statistics and things like that. We're worried about the measurement statistics and uh, samples, not entire populations of measurements and that type. So... I would suggest looking at a, a measurement oriented statistics type of course. Two, uh, two things. One, um, oh, there's a couple things in the chat, but uh, John was looking for your text file so that he could just put, input it on his software. Um, there was some information on good books oh, yeah, about uh, not only squares, but basic statistics in there as well, Dan. Um, another one, we actually did uh, week eight, all the way back three years ago, we did week eight was Trimble Business Center's network control adjustment. And then week nine, um, which was November 10th, three years ago, um, we did Starnet uh, as well. So if you wanted to kind of go back and look at both of those for anybody who's watching later, but week eight, Trimble Business Center network control. And then week nine was um, Starnet as well so uh yeah. carlson uh then john goes on to say carlson software also has an alta reporting feature so <laughs> well which strongly suggests is do not buy galani's book with the intent of reading and learning from it on your own <laughs> it's, it's it's damn near impossible to do that on your own that that it's a great textbook for a class in that where you've got an instructor leading through it but as on your own type of stuff uh it's a tough one to go through so uh, 
Well, like I say, any, any measurements, measurement science statistics course or statistics book would be good. And somebody threw up uh, measurement sciences in there, but yeah, you know, the old Buckner book. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I just clicked uh, on that link. That's still available. Uh, check in uh, used book areas also, like American Book Exchange, to see if you can find old copies of that there. Uh, you know, even this, you know, looking for statistics courses, it's easy to go off the rails and, you know, or if you start asking stuff on chats, you know, there's like, <laughs> you get crazy off into some rabbit hole of statistics. And frankly, it took me years and a dumb question to ask, why is, why is a coordinate standard deviation multiplied by 1.96 up to 95? but the axis of an error ellipse is multiplied by 2.45, right? And I had to go back to my survey, my professor, where I'd already gotten a master's degree and, and ask what, you know, sheepishly ask a dumb question. And he said, oh yeah, it's volume under a surface compared. I, you know, I had a hard time even finding that out on the internet, right? And so, um, it's hard. It's hard to find simple explanations for how this stuff is working. And, you know, we deal in surveying, we deal with so many black boxes, GNSS, scanners, drones, what the heck's going on in there. We don't have to understand all of it. We have to understand the principles of it and be able to evaluate the results. Um, so that's, you know, part of the don't kill yourself over not completely understanding the stuff. Use, I would just say the short answer is use reliable software that's been around for a long time uh, and has been doing, you know, error propagation and stuff for a long time. And, and you know, check two against each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Woo, that was a lot. <laughs> I love it. That make your brain hurt on a Monday night. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we're we're kind of getting we're getting there. I know. I love I, it. You know, <laughs> can I say? Can I mention one other thing? I've one of, one of the things. One of the reason I think there's limitations with standards is that the way the Alta, you know, they that there was something added to the 2021 Alta in you know how you compute your you know how you evaluate your relative positional precision and it basically says you only have to check the distance you only have to check the uncertainty of the distance between points and um of the distance between points which means you don't have to check the direction and i posit that the combination of that and the fact that you only have to test between adjacent boundary corners mm -hmm means that we can all go back to surveying with a steel tape and a compass as long as you're measuring directly between boundary corners. And you can put that in a correctly weighted least squares adjustment, which means you're weighting your directions bad and your distance is good. And it will pass, you will get a standard deviation of unit is what, you know, is one. And as long as you're only testing your distances, you will pass the Alta doing that. And so, you know, you can argue with me, but, you know, I've run it through Starnet. So it's just one of the reasons that, you know, these things are so confusing and, um, and that just, you know, putting your blinders on and, 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 you know, following the letter of the law in a standard is not enough. Right, you got to use your professional judgment. What are you going to get sued for doing <laughs> because someone built something, you know, on your bad boundary survey? That's you know, we're still back to that kind of stuff. Yep. And it and it goes back to you know just and we we had an instance earlier today where some of one of the guys on the mapping side was going to call off a monument fifteen by seventeen and it was located underneath a big. Uh, 138 kV power line, right? And it's like, I don't know if that's a bad shot or if that's a bad point. You know, it's one of those situations, and we definitely uh, will shoot points a couple of times. But that's another one where let's go check that one again <laughs> before uh, before you do something. So, yeah, it's interesting. But it's knowing that, like you said, knowing the environment, knowing positional awareness, and where you're at, and things that you're under, the environmental conditions that things all come into play, like that 
all fall into that positional certainty that you got to take into play. So does anybody uh, have specific questions or want to ask or everybody was quiet today? <laughs> We're still trying to wrap our heads around least squares adjustment. <laughs> exactly. That's why I said it make your brain hurt. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. This I've yeah. been looking around for, you know, I heard a quote at a institute uh, or something where someone says, um, you know, first find the corner and then measure it. <laughs> uh, was that, does, can anyone say who said that? Because I repeat it every now and then. That one's a favorite. And then all the Thomas Cooley, the, the Michigan uh, Supreme Court justice who said, you know, don't make your visitation a public calamity, you know, by slapping a bunch of math on the ground, basically. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of, I don't know if anyone knows where that first quote came from. No, that's a good one, though. I do sure. like that. Oh, that was a good, that's a great question, John. Anybody been in a, involved in a lawsuit where PP was an issue, positional certainty was an issue, but and what I guess, John, from your expert witness side of things, is it something that you bring into play as well from your side and the questions you ask and that kind of stuff? I don't know if you want to unmute or not. Uh, never had one. Gotcha. Okay. John does a lot of expert witness stuff. So I was curious to see if it was something you started asking you know, opposing attorneys or whatever on how I, I've never been involved in a, okay. a single suit where uh, precision of measurements has ever been called into question on anything. Yeah. Um, not just Alta stuff, but anytime. Um, I've never had them ever look at field notes. Um, never had them. They don't they don't understand that stuff. And so they don't drill down to that kind of level. It's so far over their heads that yeah. The attorneys don't understand it. The judge doesn't care about it. And it's never been an issue. Um, if they ask me how close a GPS point is, I'll say, yeah, it's about the size of a quarter, 50 cent, per, 50 cent piece. Right. You know, that's something they can relate to. And that's about as technical yeah. as it gets. Yeah. I know there was a, the Facebook forums over the weekend was all about field notes too. And I thought that it's funny that you bring that up, but you've never even been asked to show them. <laughs> Yeah, it's never come up. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't know how to read them. Right, exactly, exactly. No, I have requested field notes from the other side for disclosures, but uh, sure, just to see what they have, but uh, and to see what they actually did in the field, but um, yep. never from a technical standpoint in the case. Got it. Funny. Wow. You know, one other thing I'll add about the. Um, you know, specifically about the positional tolerance test was um, when I was working before I started teaching, I I, um, I ran, uh, they finally added the ALTA test to Trimble Business Center. Um, I can't remember what, some version five, something, and maybe it's changed since then. I'm not sure, but um, I had a survey where I had shot two points, um, you know, with total station and, a, you know, 100, 200 foot shots, and they were kind of, they were pretty close to each other, but they were basically both, you know, side shots. Um, uh, and then, well, I, I did direct and reverse and called each one a separate shot. So say whether that's, you know, independent shots or not, but um, uh, I put them in there and they failed the Alta. And I thought, there's no way those things are tied. Those are two total station shots that I shot one immediately after another with an S, a Trimble S6, you know, and, you know, they're good to um, the, the relative error ellipse I knew was a lot less than seven hundredths of a foot. And then I discovered that Trimble, um, but those things were kind of on the edge of the network. They were a ways away from the GPS. So their point error ellipses were bigger. Like they were like four or five hundredths of a foot on the semi-major axis, each one, right? Um, but the relative error ellipse between them was tight because of what tied them together. But Trimble, as they had implemented the Alta, was only looking at the point error ellipses and was taking the basically doing error of a sum 
saying, well, if you got that much error on one point and that much error on another point, then you've got about, you know, um, square root of two times that error for the distance between them. It was basically saying every relative measurement is like you shot each point independently with an RTK, you know, with a single rover RTK shot. And therefore, always the relative error ellipse is going to be bigger between those two points. And that's the that's incorrect. That's not the way that the Alta works. The Alta is about the relative precision between those points. I brought that up with them, and I don't think it went anywhere. But that's just another reason why you should be skeptical. Um, you know, and that's pretty reputable software. But you know, they it, they're new at implement. It would only recently implemented. So just. You know, another reason, like, you know, A1 is your professional judgment and, you know, that kind of thing. Gary, from uh, the building the test standpoint, is there, I forget the matrix on it, but how many questions are related to altas on the FS? Any idea? Do you know the percentage or? It's one of those things where there there's seven categories on the right. FS exam, right. and that doesn't sound like much, but then when you look at inside of each one, all these subtopics, there's a whole crap load of them in there, yep. and the ALTA is going to be in buried in one of those, so yep. the category itself may have 15 questions potentially on the exam, but at best, maybe one or two of them might be on the ALTA, right. uh, so it's... Yeah, and, and the thing is, at the FS level, most of them haven't had much exposure to the to the ALTA stuff. And the standards are right in the reference manual that they have available for them during the exam, so they can look up stuff in there. But uh, it's just one of those things where you want to be sure that when you give them the information, you give it to them right. And like I say, the way the standards written right now, it's kind of confusing, at least to me it is. Uh, but I'm an old fart, you know. <laughs> uh let's see okay so under the syllabus i just looked it up really quick mapping process and methods uh there's 14 to 21 questions so and within there there is a through f so like you said there's multiples and it talks about type type of maps and planning profiles and that kind of stuff so yeah, and the way I've rewritten the uh, exams for the NCL prep class, instead of just having the online exams that they take, I've broken it down into categories, and I've got a pool of questions for each of the categories now, and it randomly draws from the pool, uh, so we match kind of what is the, the divisions are there. So I've got a number of Alta questions on there but the students may or may not get any depending on how they get pulled out of the pool right. which is the same thing with the NCES exam because they pull those out of the pool also exactly yeah and then so further down uh number five survey computations in, in computer applications 17 to 26 questions and again yeah. traverse closures and adjustments least squares adjustments so yeah I mean it definitely correlates to could could correlate to up to 10 points on the exam so yeah. Well, that night, and I keep telling them whatever they call up and ask for some support and stuff like that. So, look, if you can't figure it out, look at it. There's generally two of the questions, two of the answers you can throw away as they don't make sense. Right. And if all else fails, you've just now reduced it down to a 50 50 chance of guessing <laughs> the right thing versus a 25% chance. There you go. But chances are you can look at it and you can you can reason out what the correct answer should be on a lot of those things. Um, but if they've never been exposed to it, they've never been exposed to it, you know? Correct. Yep. Understood. Mm, that was good. Great stuff, you guys. Anybody got any more uh, questions they want to ask? Dan, we're going to have to figure out a schedule for you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> maybe a, uh, I had all two your bonus a... I had ulterior motives for inviting you here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see. Wow. <laughs> I love it. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for jumping in. I love that. So uh then uh, we are back next week and then uh, off another. So we have uh, I think there's three more for the rest of the year, and then uh we'll take the winter break off. But 
and then we're back uh, January 8th again for that stuff. So a couple more back on with uh, wisdom, wisdom Wednesdays this week. Right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Round table tomorrow night and then wisdom this week as well. Um, so a couple of them this week. It's good stuff. Okay. All right. Nobody's got any other questions. I love it. Thank you both. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Have a good week, everybody. We'll see Bye you guys. folks. Bye, Bye guys. See Thank ya. you.